Hello, and welcome to, the, to, to today's Micron Value Partner webinar, Micron and VMware, Go All Flash or Go Home. Uh, I'm Matt Wilkes, Strategic Marketing Manager for Micron Storage, and I'll be your moderator for this, today's webinar. Uh, before I introduce today's presenters, though, just a couple of reminders. Finders. Um, you can submit questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A tool, and I'll ask your question of our presenters during the program. And uh, if you have to leave before we conclude, remember this webinar is recorded, and you can watch it on demand within an hour of conclusion using the same link you used to log into today. And today, actually, we'll be talking about VMware's virtual SAN and the advantages of an all-flash configuration. And we have two pre presenters with us today, uh, John Nicholson, Senior Technical Marketing Manager in VMware's Storage and Availability Business Unit in, in Houston, Texas, and Jason Massey, Infrastructure Engineer for Micron Information Technology in Folsom, California, specializing in VMware, virtualization, VDI, and data center infrastructure. And that's not all. Also with us is uh, Jason Burrows, Senior Storage Solutions Engineer at Micron Storage Software Design Center in Austin, Texas, focused on determining best practices, performances, performance characterizations, and optimization techniques for flash storage, and Joe Cook, a software development engineer for Micron's non-volatile engineering SSD product development team here in Folsom, and formerly a senior technical marketing manager at VMware. So that is quite a strong panel we have on this webcast. So please feel free to text in with questions. And uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, today for attending. And so I'd like to start with John and actually give us an update of uh, what is new with uh, Virtual SAN. Hi, this is John Nicholson. I'm with VMware uh, with uh, technical marketing, as he describes. Um, let's talk about vSAN real quick here. Um, first off, let me give you just a quick introduction. So VMware, as you all know and love, we virtualize compute. That's the core vSphere platform. That's what we've you know, known and loved all these years. And what we're, we're trying to do is virtualize the entire data center. And kind of the, the concept of this is software-defined data centers. So in addition to networking, which you may have heard of NSX and software-defined networking, we're also using software-defined storage with vSAN to virtualize storage. And to give you kind of a, a brief idea of the challenges we're looking to face, in storage today is one, simplicity. A lot of traditional storage arrays, um, I believe I used to describe the management as managed by spreadsheet. Uh, there's a lot of complexity. There were a lot of choices that had to be made up front of you know, what type of RAID levels, what type of performance you chose, and you kind of had to live with those, and it wasn't always a great thing. So we wanted to make it simple. We also wanted performance and scalability. We wanted to be able to scale out, scale deep, add capacity, add performance. We also wanted cost to be under control, because storage has often becomes kind of an out-of-control cost center in a lot of organizations. And then choice. Um, while a lot of people like to take a hardware-defined approach with a physical appliance that's got a lot of limits, we wanted to choose software. What this allows you to do is use any server OEM that we've certified. We work with all the major vendors, all the ones that are already in your data center today, so that you can choose that hardware as well as from a component standpoint, be able to work with all the flash vendors, so that way you can choose best of breed, best cost, best delivered solution for what you need. So a little bit about vSAN architecture and what vSAN is specifically, is vSAN is a distributed object storage system. What this allows you to do is provide clustered shared storage without having to have a dedicated storage array or system. And how this function is by default, we mirror all data to two separate disks within your cluster. So every time a write comes in, it mirrors out, so that way you can tolerate the loss of a disk or loss of a host. We also leverage flash in, in one of two ways, either in a hybrid system to where we have traditional spinning disks fronted by regular disks, and that flash is used for both read and write cache, as well as also for an all flash system that allows us a great performance but lets us leverage some flash that has a higher endurance capability so we don't burn out flash with lower cost capacity flash so we can get a better price point. Now vSAN, one of the great design principles we made is that it's a part of the kernel, it's part of vSphere. So today, if you're using ESXi 5.5 Update 1 or newer, you actually already have vSAN. You may just not have a license, you may not have checked this box yet. The configuration is very simple, you just need some basic networking setup, and then you go to your cluster settings and check a box, and you're, you're off to the races. Going 
going back to the major architectures, we've got, again, the hybrid and the flash. And what we've been able to do is really push some amazing performance. Uh, particularly with the traditional hybrid, which is where a lot of traditional vSAN deployments have been up until now, and all flash, which was introduced in 6.0, and we're really looking and excited about the future. Um, these numbers are actually a little dated. I've actually seen well over 100,000 IOPS even. And flash really is what's getting us excited from being able to provide sub-millisecond latency to all of our applications. And what this allows you to do is do some exciting things you weren't able to do before. As much as I like to talk about infrastructure is it's the most exciting thing. At the end of the day, it's plumbing. And what this allows you to do, though, is deliver better experiences to end users and applications. This allows VDI to scale like it never did before. This allows your application groups to get reports in seconds or minutes rather than, you know, hours or days. This allows businesses to do more exciting things. And let's talk next about some of the use cases for vSAN, where we're seeing customers use it. Um, over 60% of customers report using uh, vSAN for uh, Tier 1 business critical applications, uh, which wasn't necessarily where we were starting when we initially launched it, but uh, particularly with the performance improvements in 6 and with the all-flash support, um, customers are really excited about using it for that. For any case where maybe you have an existing data center, but you need an isolated cluster and you need something that's air-gapped out or separated, a DMZ or a management cluster, or maybe you want your staging and QA isolated from your existing traditional legacy infrastructure, uh, a small vSAN cluster can provide a lot of power and capabilities. Uh, for customers with DR, they're doing a refresh on their DR site. They don't want to spend the money that they have on traditional infrastructure. A vSAN cluster provides a great solution. And then also with 6.1, we now have remote office branch office. So that allows us to do small two-host two clusters at remote sites. So let's get a little deeper in. One thing that's really great about vSAN is we work off of a policy engine. What this does is we have the concept of failures to tolerate. So by default vSAN today, you have what's called failure to tolerate a one. This means you can tolerate one host failure, one disk failure, one component failure. But this is dynamically changeable. You could set this to two, then you would replicate an additional time. Or you could even set it to zero if you had a serial or test dev data that you didn't really care about bothering the mirror and waste overhead. What's really cool about this is you can also change stripes, you can also change cache reservations, and you can do all this on the fly. Your traditional storage array, if you try to change RAID on the fly, you're probably going to have to move a lot of data around. With vSAN, all these things can be changed on the fly without any real disruption. And one thing we're doing also is with the all flash, which we're here to talk about today, is we have an initial kind of right buffer system where we, you take your, your good high endurance, little price here flash, and that absorbs that initial flash. And, and hot data will actually stay in there. And as that data ages out, it will move down to your capacity flash, where probably a lot of your reads will end up coming from. And this way you can have flash that maybe ha um, is able to deliver 10 drive writes per day, and flash that's able to deliver only maybe a third of a drive write per day, mixed it together to get kind of the best of breed of performance and capacity. Now our caching algorithms are really smart, and there's actually a great white paper around this. And one question I get a lot is about, does vSAN move data around? So if I do a vMotion, we move data. We don't, and the reason for that is there's a lot of overhead on moving data, and the network is fundamentally faster than today's flash technologies. So unlike some of our competitors where when you trigger a vMotion or if you turn on DRS, you'll see drops of 50 or 80% of performance, you can leverage all of the VMware technologies today, vMotion, HA, DRS, et cetera, without performance penalty. A VM can move around the cluster and you'll see consistent latencies. And consistency is really what everybody likes from a, from a performance standpoint. Let's talk about the new 6.1 release here real quick. Now we've got a couple a couple features. Um, obviously, with the 6.0 release, we had 64 hosts. We've got the new snapshots. We don't have the traditional performance penalty of legacy VM snapshots and clones. And we also have rack awareness, so you can make sure data is distributed into different racks or different pods in your data center. In 6.1, we introduced stretch cluster support. So what this means is, if you have less than five milliseconds between two data centers, you can stretch a cluster. So that means if you have a failure at one data center. VMware high availability will automatically start rebooting at the other data center. Or you could also do disaster avoidance, or if you're doing planned maintenance, you can move, you can vMotion those virtual machines between data centers. This is a really awesome technology. Um, and particularly, I would see a lot of interest from European customers. I think they have a lot of 
fiber stretched across short distances. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is for those of us here in Texas, for instance, where five milliseconds, most of our cities are quite a bit farther than that, we also support vSphere replication. And while vSphere replication traditionally only delivers a 15 minute recovery point objective, so your data is only as fresh as 15 minutes, with vSAN and 6.1, we now support a five minute RPO target. So you can stretch your cluster locally and then replicate out to somewhere quite a bit farther away, maybe like Arizona, for instance, for us, it's nice and boring and nothing too dangerous happens. We've made some improvements to the vRealize operations management pack. So for those of you who are looking for deep level storage nerd numbers, cache hit ratios, things like that, you can really take a good deep dive into there. That's built into the, into the storage uh, plugins within vRealize operations. The health and performance monitoring. So if you want to make sure your vSAN cluster is, is up to snuff and it's performing well, you can do simulated disk tests. We also will test multicast performance. It'll test and, and stress your environment. You can even do burn-in, so you want to do an eight-hour burn-in on the cluster before you go live. That way you know you don't have any fragile components, you know everything's been well vetted, and it gives you that, that confidence there. So, so uh, John. Oh. Yes? Yes, no, yeah, I have a question there. For the, uh, for like the replication and the stretch cluster, is, is there advantage of an all-flash vSAN versus hybrid for those types of uh, capabilities? Um, there's definitely always an advantage to all flash, first of all. And from a, from a performance perspective, with an all flash, um, for instance, for replication, you're not necessarily going to have to wait on cache to rewarm versus a hybrid architecture. So you're going to get that environment rather than have to wait on cache to warm from a replication, that's going to give you a great advantage. From a stretch cluster perspective, if you're, anytime you're doing a failover event, and you have to resync a bunch of data, you're doing a fail back, those flash drives can deliver a lot faster performance. So you should be able to reprotect a lot quicker. Um, mm -hmm. Those would be the big all flash, I guess, exciting things about those. So what you get is quicker disaster recovery or replication. Everything's faster with flash. I mean, come on. Oh yeah. <laughs> so let me take a little more time before I hand the mic over here and talk a little bit about the future. So hopefully there's no lawyers on the line and standard forward-looking disclaimers apply here. These are, some th I'm gonna discuss a couple things in the upcoming beta. And actually it's an ongoing beta right now. Um, so the traditional vSAN does mirroring, which carries a 50% overhead for protection of failure to tolerate a one or, a, or you know, an even further 66% for failure to tolerate a two. Uh, what we're looking in the, in the beta, what we're testing right now is what's called a RAID 5 and RAID 6. And it's really a erasure coding, but we're calling it RAID 5 and 6 so people will recognize the term. And so you're going to see a lot lower overhead for data protection. So instead of having 60 gigabytes to protect, uh, you know, of use to protect a uh, 20 gig that's triple replicated, we now would just have a 30 gigabytes use. So really great on capacity and particularly these technologies we're, we're eyeing them for all flash um, and this should help make flash right now flash has already overtaken 15k drives from a cost perspective and we're looking for technologies like this erasure coding um, and my I think next slide let's see here compression and deduplication to help kind of push it over the edge and make it to where flash finally kills 10,000 rpm drives uh, and that's the other thing we're looking at, um, and it's actively in the beta right now, and people are kicking the tires on, is flash. And so uh, dedupe and compression. And that's going to allow us, particularly for people who have duplicate data or compression, if you have databases, uh, compression is really great. You know, if we can, it's not uncommon for me to see databases that can be compressed down two to one or more. And so if we can get flash, you know, for Micron, that's in the 60, 70 cent range right now for capacity, and we can compact that down even further, we can potentially start, you know, approaching, you know, that $2, $1 effective to deploy cost per gigabyte for flash, which really at that point, you know, is your, if your data is not worth that, why are you even storing it? So that kind of helps make flash a no-brainer. Getting back again, we've got some additional performance monitoring and things that will be coming in with uh, we're looking at doing. And... I think, oh, I had one last slide here. So one thing to keep in mind is vSAN is not a clustered file system. 
The reason for that is clustered file systems, they carry a lot of baggage with them. Doing highly disruptive updates where you completely change the file system, it's not something that's very easy to do on them. They also have limitations on scale. While you can scale them into the petabytes, you typically make a lot of sacrifices around block size. They carry a lot of CPU and memory overhead. What VSAN is, is an object storage system. And object storage systems are really cool. And one, they can scale cleanly into the petabytes without a huge amount of overhead. And while today vSAN, that object storage system, is only accessed through a VMFS shim layer that you see, so it's used for VM storage, there's really nothing stopping us down the road from looking at, as you see on the slide here, providing maybe native file access to containers, providing REST API access for direct object storage. There's a lot of cool things that are possible. Uh, Duncan's got some great musings on his blog, and so just something to think about. So, so at this point, I'll hand off the mic, and if anyone has any quick questions on that, I'm more than willing to discuss them. Yeah, actually, we do have one question from the audience here. Uh, question is, will there be any changes to the uh, cache hardware compatibility list requirements with 6.2, like higher density or endurance changes? So I can't speak directly to 6.2, but 6.1, I believe, um, you actually there were some changes made. Uh, you'll notice that we, we actually got a little more relaxed. Instead of saying 10 drive writes per day, we started saying terabytes written. So some drives that were kind of on the fence, they were just a little too low if they're larger drives now. Um, you may see within a drive series where maybe the 200 gig drive didn't make the cut, but the 400 will now. I would encourage everyone to recheck the, the vSAN VCG configuration guide, um, the HCL, and, and look at that. So that, that's something that kind of snuck out and I don't think a lot of people paid attention to. Great. Uh, don't have any other questions right now, but I do want to remind uh, everyone listening uh, in that please uh, you can start typing in questions now, and we'll uh, we'll get them answered here during during the webcast. So uh, next up, we actually have uh, Jason Massey on the line. Jason, are you there? I am. Take it away, Jason. All right. So uh, as Matt introduced. Um, one of the on the VMware SME for Micron, and uh, I've been using VMware for a long time, to say the least, and I use it every day. So, when vSAN came out, um, obviously it was a new, exciting product, and with Micron's SSDs, you know, we jumped right into an all-flash configuration and saw immediate performance improvement, and with that. Now, as we've gone through a couple of iterations and, you know, newer drives have come out, drives are becoming less expensive, we start looking at the viability of an all-flash versus the hybrid. So uh, when you look at kind of your infrastructure, a lot of people have obstacles. Um, generally, you either have a performance issue or you're about to have a performance issue. And so you're looking forward and thinking, am I going to have to do a hardware lifecycle refresh? You know, am I going to have to replace a SAN? Am I going to have to replace a NAS? Whatever it might be. And what are the options and what are the uh, use cases that I need to replace that functionality with? The next piece, too, is a lot of times with normal configurations, uh, monolithic devices, SAN, NAS, whatever it might be, those are external devices, and they sometimes and they do have scalability limits. There's going to be a limit where you're going to say, okay, I can't add any more devices to that resource, whether it's for performance, capacity, or some combination thereof. And then you have manageability. How am I going to manage all this functionality? How am I going to migrate from one device to another, what are the downtimes, you know, what does it take to do the migration, do I have to hire additional people, do I have to hire, do I have to have additional software to be able to migrate live, do I have to require downtime, that type of thing, and then of course there's the uncertainty. Am I very in tune with my customers, am I not in tune with my customers, so with all that, you know, what that goes kind of back into the manageability and the scalability, and in some cases the performance, what, what are my unknown growths that may pop up, and how can I deal with those functionalities? So as we've looked at storage, obviously, you know, SAN has been around forever, and we all know that it's on its way out. Um, when you look at this kind of chart, I'm not going to go into extreme detail, but it kind of shows your capacities and then 
the other piece that has really stemmed some of the all flash arrays, which has been, VDI has been one of the big ones, and it's because of the spiky workloads, right? The noisy neighbor, the extreme spikes of either updates, recompose, refresh, you know, login storms, boot storms, whatever it might be, those really stemmed the initial AFAs to come around. And now those are being used in a lot of different areas because of the benefits. But again, when we look at any of these types of functionalities, whether it's uh, an AFA or a SAN or a NAS, there's a, a limit to the scale. And then also, if it's a hybrid solution, right, you've got to pay or you've got to add a lot of functionality for caching or, you know, optimization for that piece of it, and that's an additional cost for that functionality, and it's more complex. So then vSAN comes out and greatly reduces the complexity. And currently, and well, currently right now, that's the, the big thing that we're trying to show is that all flash and hybrid are essentially the same cost, but the benefits are substantial on the all flash. And as we continue through and start talking about some of these things, there's, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna dive into one of the use cases and uh, then continue into some of the benefits. But when you talk about, you know, a big concern that people have had is, oh, my drives are gonna wear out or, you know, it's too expensive and, you know, how's that gonna work for my deployment? I don't need that performance. Well, if you're talking about the cost being minimally ex more expensive or in some cases the same cost, the benefits are substantial compared to hybrid. Um, one of the cases that we dove into was VDI, again, because of the all flash arrays, that was one of the big, the popular ones. Um, some of the requirements, you know, we were looking at 800 desktops, which is 200 desktops per node, four nodes. Um, some of the requirements, you know, a lot of times the average is, you know, okay, we want one, one gig of RAM, we did three gigs of RAM. You know, we did uh, linked clones, so you have a 30 gig master and about a 15 gig adder, so we needed about 12 and a half terabytes. Now, one of the things that they recommended a minimum is 25 IOPS. Now, your average 7200 RPM can do at least 60, sometimes up to 100. So if you're gonna give your customers uh, 25 IOPS, if that's how you're managing your environment, you're probably gonna have a lot of uh, concerned customers, to say the least. Basically, your help desk phone's gonna be running off the hook. So with those minimums, you're looking at, you know, 20K OBS, same thing, two CPUs. At an eight to one, you need about 200 threads. Um, so an optimal host, you know, we can see and read there, 25 core, 600 gigs of RAM, three terabytes. The systems that we built, this is for each node. Um, we had 768 gigs of RAM. We used 14 core CPUs. We had 28 raw cores, um, 3.8 terabytes effective, so 7.6 raw. That's with a uh, FTT, failure to tolerate of one, and a one uh, U form factor, and we used four 10 gig interfaces. Um, one of the note, just if, if you're not sure about, 10 gig is actually required for all flash, and that is because, as John had stated earlier, the replication is significantly faster on all flash, so you need to have the network bandwidth in order to keep up and enable that functionality. Uh, we'll go into uh, the next piece. So when we did this, so this is, we gave each oh. CPU. Go ahead. Oh no! So yeah. So this setup that you had, like you were, I, I, I want to make sure I re reiterate this. Uh, all the hosts you, you're able to these 800 VMs you did with your 4U system. These are actually useful VMs. Uh, you may see uh, examples of you know, other configurations that, are, that can tout that they did 800 virtual machines, but it's at the minimum requirements or at least a not a uh, good customer experience. Right, so that was kind of the thing is that we gave each VM three gigs of RAM and we gave each, C each VM two CPUs. So those are moderate, you know, those are reasonable VMs for everybody to use and have, you know, completely reasonable response with any type of standard desktop t type functionality. And then that was kind of what we were shooting for because we didn't want to say, you know, one gig of, one gig of RAM, one CPU, those aren't, real, real, those aren't realistic, you know, unless you're just using them as login hosts. These are functionally 
you know, you can use these VMs as whatever you need to use them for. And the other thing, the big benefit with all flash is that you eliminate the noisy neighbor. Now, one of the things that I'm showing here is we use a tool called Login VSI. It's kind of an it's an industry standard for testing virtual desktop deployments. And what it does is it goes in and it continuously powers on VMs and provisions VMs out and does a bunch of common uses, mail, Word, surfing the web, maybe in Excel, all this type of functionality. And every time it launches a desktop, you start seeing your latency and your performance decrease. So the idea is how far can I go before I hit what's called a login VSI max, which is at that point, that's that far X there on the right, that says you now have such degraded performance and latency that it is unusable. So when we look at this, when we ran this job, we initially ran, we have a thousand seat license, when we ran it on the four hosts, we were unable to reach VSI, the login VSI max. Um, we maxed out our licenses first. So we played some tricks and uh, forced the VMs to run on two hosts, and but used the full vSAN four node functionality. And when we ran that, we got out to a login VSI max of 600. So that's 300 VMs per desktop. Now, officially, VMware supports, it's a soft number, around 200 desktops. And that's just because the average deployments, um, if you start going over 200, you have a potential of running into performance issues. Now, if we can run 300 per node, it, let's take a look at this 200 number, that first line. If I take a host and I put it in maintenance mode, I'm now at 300 per node, and I still have plenty of headroom. I'm not even close to running out of any performance or any, running into any latency numbers. So by running an all-flash configuration, not only do you ensure that you're not going to have a problem with noisy neighbor, you are going to ensure consistent performance, you also have the ability to take hosts down and still maintain all those performance requirements. So there's, that's, that's one of the substantial benefits with an all-flash array. Oh, excuse yeah, me, an all-flash so VSAN. So with, if you had this as a hybrid version, there, would be, there could be noisy neighbor uh, concerns? Very much so. So when we ran the same exact same thing, but ran in a hybrid configuration, we maxed out at about 60 desktops per node. So at all the same configuration in the VM itself, but the difference just being the back end being hybrid versus all flash, we maxed out at 60, and it was horrible at 60. We actually started getting unwanted VMs, and the test started to fail. So it was definitely a, a substantial difference. And so with that, say you're only 60, and that's a max, you really don't have the headroom to handle that noisy neighbor, to handle boot storms, to handle, you know, McAfee logins if you're, or McAfee updates if you're not staggering them like you should. And, you know, same, if there's all these things that you have to be very careful with with hybrid versus all flash. All flash can handle any of those workloads at the same time running databases, whatever, it doesn't matter. They All you get consistent performance. So it's a huge, huge difference in the uh, performance and late, you know, sub-millisecond latency. Now, as I had talked about earlier, one of the things that we, you know, stemmed the all-flash array was virtual desktop. Now, they are fast. There is no question about that capability. But one of the things that you really gain, actually there's a couple of things, that you really gain with an all-flash vSAN is that not only do you get your storage, you also get your compute. So when you talk about that functionality, right, you're looking at, okay, about 25K per node, and you also have to buy storage. Now, we're just talking storage in this slide, but don't forget you now have to deal with other connectivity, right? What am, if it's going to be a SAN, then I have to have a fiber path. So I have to add that functionality. So I'm adding more complexity, and I'm adding more points of management. And that goes back to, you know, originally when I was talking about infrastructure requirements and, you know, managing and challenging and obstacles. I've added more complexity to my environment. With an all-flash, all you need is your 10-gig switch and everything else is included. Now, 
with a AFA, they don't scale like vSAN. Every time I add a node, I'm dividing the capacity and I'm also dividing the performance. So if I have two nodes, it's divided by two. If I add four, it's divided by four. Eventually, I will hit a limit, even on an all-flash array. As vSAN, I just add another node, and I get another 100K IOPS, and I get additional CPU and memory resources, and I also get that a broader scale of failover. I get a bigger cluster, and now I've linearly scaled my performance and my uh, cluster resources. So that's one of the other huge benefits of the vSAN and especially the all-flash vSAN is it scales linearly. So continuing on, you know, we, we get a lot of questions about, oh, well, you know, these drives are cheaper. Well, yes, the 7.2K, right, your 7200 RPM drives, yeah, they are cheaper. But what are you going to use that for? Because you know the performance now you can't quite see it in here, but this the little tiny line below the dollar bar is actually your IOPS. And we call it out on the M510DC, which is the drive we're using for capacity because that's kind of the, the, the people are like, oh, well, I can go hybrid and my capacity will be much cheaper. Well, we have a 960 gig drive that's coming out at around 60 cents a gigabyte, but the IOPS are substantial I mean, it's not even relatively close. I mean, even with your 15K SAS, which is, you know, almost over a buck a gigabyte, you gain a little bit more performance, but nothing even close to what you can do with an SSD. So when you start looking at this and you start looking at these costs, the only one that can get you less, your dollars less and your dollars per gig less is a 7200 RPM drive. So, again, what am I going to use that for? I can't run any performance on that. I can't do anything that's going to require any types of IOPS because that drive is not going to be able to deliver that functionality. The latency, once I get past the cache, which I'm going to show here in the next piece, just goes through the roof. It's basically unmanageable. So going well, into also, that, that whole... And yeah. also with, with the new uh, capabilities on the vSAN 6.2 with the dedupe and compression, you can't use that with the hybrid drives. Correct. That's something that they're saying that the the overhead, the spinning media is it, it's looking like it's going to be unsupportable because it's just too much overhead for spinning media. There worse versus what they're starting to see with the all flash is that the overhead is minimal because the drives can respond so much faster. So doing a comparison on what does it take to get a hybrid to perform equal to an all-flash. This first node, what we had done is taken a bunch of hard drives, or excuse me, a bunch of databases, and we started off and made them big enough to go past the cache. So now you're going straight to your capacity tier. And immediately, once you go past your capacity tier, the bottom line is your hybrid, your performance immediately starts dropping. And in some cases, we started getting timeouts in our transactions. And the, the response from the tests were just literally, they were, we were getting timeouts and the tests were failing. Now, as we kept adding databases, you'll see that just the, the performance plummets. But on the all-flash array, it actually goes up. Now, that's kind of an odd line because why would it go up? Well, at the 500 gig range, it's doing everything as fast as it can do based on a single database. That doesn't mean that the hardware can't do more performance. That was basically operating systems, OS, database capabilities. So as I add another database, the disks can actually increase. They show that there's still more performance available. And that goes back to the headroom and the additional resources that you have available in an all-flash vSAN. Now, you can get a hybrid to perform as that green line, but it requires 3x. So if I have four nodes, I'd have to have 12 nodes of hybrid in order to get that same performance. So these are the, the points that we're trying to make is that really what are you saving? If you, if you just need pure capacity, sure, hybrid probably makes sense. 
But anything past that, you're you're just you're wasting your money because at our I mean this is at our current drives our current drive prices which as we release more drives and we start getting into the two and three terabytes of capacity drives these numbers this the only one that has a chance at the 7200 RPM it's not going to have a chance anymore and then especially with the dedupe and compression you've now com the 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 paradox completely switches where now you're actually paying more for a hybrid solution than you are for an all flash VCN. So now I'm going to go into some of the additional benefits. If we take the exact same thing and we're just looking at them, we're looking at a single server with SSDs idles at around seven versus a hundred watts. Doesn't seem like much, but when you're talking about hundreds of nodes for some of these large deployments, maybe huge VDI deployments, you start getting into the kilowatts. Additionally, this is idle. This is not running. When you go and start using these, the separation increases and you start getting, you know, it might go up to 75 watts on an SSD, but the HDD might go into, you know, 100, 150, 175 watts. So that separation of power starts adding to your TCO, right? So now I'm paying more for what, that extra little bit of that reduced cost that I bought for that 7200 RPM, because that's the only one that's viable against all flash cost. Everyone, all the other ones, all the SAS and all the, uh, you know, 10K, 15K, those are more expensive and you gain nothing for those. Um, cooling, because again, huge difference, um, there's a lot of data centers that are at max cooling. If you go in there and were just to change out with SSDs, you would reduce your cooling footprint because you'd be reducing the power generated by the servers from the drives. Additionally, the power used by, consumed by the drives would be reduced. Um, another huge benefit is vibration. Um, Dun I've been talking to Duncan and I talked to another customer at VMworld. Duncan had been working on deploying um, vSAN out to an oil rig. It absolutely required all fl uh, flash because the vibration from the oil rig could, it was destroying their standard media. So they had to go to, all, to an all flash. Um, I talked to another customer that had been using a fan for NASCAR, NASCAR, and he was literally rebuilding his fan every six months. I'm like, what are you doing? So we explained this whole situation. So he's going to be switching to all flash V fan because he reduces his complexity and now he doesn't have the impact of the vibration destroying his drives. You know, there's other, a lot of people don't realize some of the data center, depending on, you know, your environment, maybe it's a colo where there's a lot of traffic and people are slamming doors. Every time you have that type of vibration, it's shortening the life of a spinning media drive. So these are all things that a lot of people forget. Uh, some of the other benefits, you know, when you, this goes back to that 7200, we've got the new M510 DC. Right now it's about 60 cents a gigabyte. With some of our newer drives, that's just going to be going down because of the capacity, especially, you know, we've got the 3D X point coming out and it, our 3D NAND, that type of thing. There's, these prices are just going to continue to go down. So the, kind of the big message is don't go waste your money on a hybrid. Just go all flash. And the thing is, another piece that a lot of people will forget is you don't have to scale these things completely full. Right, So you can buy a node, go buy your chassis and say, okay, well, I only need about three or four terabytes per node. Okay, so only put in, you know, three or four drives. Maybe you only do one or two disk groups. But buy the right chassis depending on what you think your scale is going to go to. And so you could start off with, say, three or four nodes, and you might have, you know, 13 terabytes. And if your drive bays aren't full, you now can, instead of have to buy another node, you could just say, okay, well, now I'm going to add another three or four drives. And say you get to a max, well, that might be in a year or so. Well, by then, we're going to start having these larger drives. You can then just swap them out, and now you have more capacity. And then, of course, if you need more performance, then you would just add another node, which gains you more performance and more capacity. Uh, another piece that's kind of a lot of people forget about is the wear endurance. With the way VMware wrote the caching mechanism by maintaining hot data in the cache and then also aligning the writes and writing in one meg chunks 
the endurance is, is actually significantly higher. Um, there's no real way to quantify that at this time. Um, that's something that we're working on. But when you write in these one meg blocks, you're not doing the 4K, which is horrible. One meg is like the perfect way to write. So the endurance is significantly higher. And we have not seen any drives, and we've been hammering these. And VMware's been hammering some Micron drives as well. And we've got a, they've got a batch that's been running for three years. And so far, no problem. Huge benefit, you know, easy setup. That's one of the things that I really like about it. Um, you know, super simple. I don't have to deal with external storage. I don't have to deal with external switches. All I need is a, my standard network switch, which I'm probably going to have anyway. Hardware life cycles. No longer do I have to take downtime. I can, you know, put a host in maintenance mode, pull it out, upgrade it, do whatever, put it back in, no downtime. Um, and then, like John said, you start doing stretch clusters. A lot of people, a lot of sites that are bigger are doing stretch data centers. Um, you know, it might be just a small hop across the camp to campus, so your latency is very low. So you just have two two locations that are essentially part of the same data center and or cluster, and you can just migrate back and forth without having to. Oh well, does that filer? You know, what am I doing with that filer? Do I have a filer over there? Am I replicating? You can actually have it all within. You know, again, it all depends on your your latency of your network, but. There's a huge benefit. It's just a huge reduction in complexity for your environment. Uh, so you can see that when you talk about vSAN and then when you talk about all flash vSAN, the benefits are substantial. The old monolithic devices are, are pretty much, they're on their way out. There's, there's no way that anybody is going to want to continue to purchase those for, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the installations. Uh, of course, there's always a, a unique use case, uh, but at this current time, you know, it's you could replace probably 80 percent of the, the VMware environments with all flash vSAN, increase performance, reduce complexity, and have very consistent performance. Wow! So with that, let's uh, let's open it up to some questions. Okay, I think we do have a couple of questions. Um, yeah, so a uh, question here. So is it harder to set up an all-flash vSAN versus a hybrid? Uh, it is no, not. I mean, it's from a manager. It is, John. Uh, from a, it is not. In fact, I would argue there's even less to configure because now you don't have to necessarily size, um, debate whether you want to add extra flash or not, like on a hybrid, and, and do cache reservations aren't even an option anymore. So uh, it's... It's easy either way. It's radically simple, and it's even simpler for all flash. So. Ah, great. Um, oh, it's a good one here. So, sh do, should I be worried about an all flash vSAN chewing, chewing through the endurance? I guess we kind of uh, answered that with the. Uh... Yeah. So you know that's kind of the big piece is that you if currently with the current models, as long as you purchase, you know, you do your higher endurance for your cache. Your capacity drive, the, the endurance on that, like I said, because of the one meg writes, it, it's very, you know, if you do a, what are we talking about, less than a one fill per day, you're still going to be safe. And if you're concerned about that piece, right, say you're like, I, I know I'm going to be writing to the capacity a lot. Okay, well, you have options to buy, and that's kind of one of the other nice things about Micron is we have different, you know, different endurance levels that you can purchase. So if you have a, an unlimited budget, if you really wanted to, you could do your 10 fills per day on your capacity tier. It's probably way past what you would require, but if that's a concern of yours, that's definitely, you know, an option. But everything that we've seen, and, uh, you know, that's something that we're working with, we've got some products that we're working to show more of that capability that says, look, you're not writing and wearing this drive out as much as you think you are. Additionally, the SSDs, the newer form, especially the enterprise drives, they're very careful about writing to a single cell over and over and over again. So they tend to, you know, peanut butter that, that write. If there's something that, for some reason, somebody keeps writing the same data, first of all, it's going to be put in the hot cache, so it's not going to be written again and again. And if it has to be accessed a lot, it stays in the cache. And when you're talking about reads, of course, there's, there's no impact with reads. 
Uh, we do have another one here. Um, oh, this is a good one. So should I wait for NVMe to go before I go all flash? So if you were to purchase the correct chassis, you could actually start out with all flash right now using your SAS or SATA and or some combination thereof. And then later when NVMe is available, you could put in an NVMe drive. Uh, but as far as waiting right now, um, their your performance. What it, the the big thing that NVMe is going to enable is getting direct access. So we're going to get you know additional performance um, and reduced complexity in the actual chassis itself because now we're eliminating the um, the storage device. So as far as waiting, I mean you're getting at 100k IOPS per uh, node, you know, unless now, unless I mean, we don't even know what the performance is going to be with the NVMe, but I, we're not necessarily. It's it's not going to be a like a you know, the difference between hybrid and all flash going with a SAS or SATA. Um, you know, I mean, we've got a lot of deployments that are using a PCIe as a cache, and same thing. I mean, it's it's just it, the way it works functionally. Uh, your performance isn't going to be substantially different. It's just going to be reduced in complexity. Okay, so it won't be yeah, it won't be orders of magnitude Hopefully that difference answers in the question. performance. Yeah, like it, it won't be orders of magnitude difference in performance. It, it, the the system complexity will be reduced. Um, but even right now, you're talking about with the uh, um, recovery time, you know, under five minutes, and, and you can do uh, remote uh, disaster recovery, you know, for remote locations. Quickly with all flash. That's uh, the fact that having flash as your storage media is really the uh, the driving factor. Um, are there question? what? Uh, uh, yeah, let's open it up for some of. We've got uh, Joe and uh, and uh, Jason Burrows there too. Um, so what are uh, what are the, like the best workloads for an all flash vSAN? You know, um, that's kind of the, the big, one of the biggest benefits is it doesn't matter. We have run VDI and databases at the same time and seen both of them perform above anything else that we've been able to run, you know. So you don't have to worry about that, what workload am I going to run? You can run any workload. You can run heavy databases. You can run Exchange. You can run... Massive VDI. I mean, that's kind of the other thing. You know, people talk about robo. You know, if you've got, you know, a moderate remote office, and you know, maybe you've got a person doing some database stuff. Maybe you've got, you know, some finance people doing some uh, Excel type workload. You can run all of that on an all flash robo installation and not have to go put some, you know, larger, higher performance. SAN or NAS at that location. So now you've this, this is John. effectively uh, reduced. This is John, if I, can, if I can interrupt. On the robo, we're seeing a lot of customer interest uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, no moving, no, no vibration tolerance problems. Um, there's a lot of cases where people have remote offices or branch offices or things that are in fairly nasty environments. And so <laughs> for that remote. thermal tolerance and a vibration, that's something where it, it, it kind of surprised me. It wasn't even always performance. It was just you can you can buy some servers that are rated for higher heat, and when you you take out spinning drives, you take out a huge uh, you take out a lot of failure uh, concerns from an environmental standpoint. And see, those are like John said; these are things that people kind of they don't really think about. And you know, the more we've brought this these these other benefits out, you know, they start thinking, oh yeah, you know, I don't have an admin at my remote site, so I'm not going to be able to go up there and fix it. I'm not going to be able to, you know, swap something out, but if I had an all flash, my failures are greatly reduced, my complexity is greatly reduced. In a lot of cases, you could just say, I'm going to configure this at this location and ship it here and ask this, you know, admin, you know, your secretary to literally, you know, get some help, rack this thing and plug two things in and, you know, you've, you can do the remote setup and, You've got all the performance, reduced complexity, you know, environments can be a little more harsh, a lot more harsh, actually. And that's one of the big things that the industry is finding is that 
these harsh environments are requiring flash, and it's not for the performance. It's for the endurance of the environment. Interesting. Um, from our panel, uh, uh, Jason or Joe, do you have any questions you wanted yeah. to ask? Uh... Um, this, this is Jason Burroughs in Austin. I was just going to mention a couple of things. Um, first off, one of the great things about vSAN is that you manage it using the same interface that the virtualization engineers are already used to. Um, so you're already in vCenter, everybody's already moving to the web client, um, everything's managed through that same interface. So where you have people wondering, how do you manage this all flash array, is, you know, do I need to learn yet another interface, um, it, it's all in the same interface, which is, which is great. Um, in our Austin office, early next year, we'll be publishing a series of white papers and performance briefs and a lot of other material about the application performance that we're seeing, which has been great. Synthetic workloads, database workloads, all the things we've been talking about, we'll be testing in great detail and publishing papers about that next year. Oh, now we're getting some more questions here. Um, so let's see. Here's a question. So how does how do the uh, vSAN solutions compare to a uh, hyperconverged infrastructure from companies like SimpliVity or Nutanix? This is John. Um, so vSAN is a component can be a component of a hyperconverged solution. It's software defined storage, and that's fundamentally a key piece of any HCI deployment. You can basically have your you can use vSAN as an HCI deployment using the vSAN ready nodes, which are basically a way of buying pre built you know predefined um, appliances that already have, you know, set disk and memory and CPU configuration, as well as also we have the Evo Rail uh, platform, which has a more turnkey appliance type node. Uh, we also have the Ready to Run program coming out um, that I believe has been launched, where basically we have it pre-installed with some some wizards and things. But there's more on that you'll hear in the future. Um, we have another question here about uh, what are the advantages of vSAN versus vVols, vVOLS? So vVols, um, I think I've jokingly called them training wheels for vSAN administration. Uh, so oh, they both share one, they, they share one key component, and that's the storage-based policy management, which is a real big mouthful that I've slowly gotten better at saying. And what that is is the concept of you defining policies of saying, I want the following level of data protection, the following type of striping, or I want data reduction in the form of compression. And then being able to dynamically apply that and the storage system go figure out how to deliver it. So as opposed to the old way of managing storage, where I would call it my, my storage admin, which I used to be one, and say, hey, I need some ones. And he'd say, well, what RAID do you want? I go, I don't know, what's the fastest one? You know, and you, you go back and forth. VSAN and, and storage-based policy management, which vVols allows also uh, by connecting to your traditional arrays that support vVols, allows you from VMware to say, I need this. I need a, a LUN that is replicated, that is protected, that is compressed, and it will go find an array that, that does that. Now, only certain arrays support that today, and there are some limits sometimes about how many LUNs or components they'll support, so watch out for that. But um, if you... If you like vVols, you'll love vSAN. So. Well, okay. Oh, we have another question here. Um, so, could I save money if I use consumer SSDs? Would, would that be? Is that an option? So this is John. Um, I've actually got a great blog post I did about a year ago. And there's a couple of reasons why we I, we don't certify or recommend consumer SSDs. We we do a lot of extra testing. There's actually a separate test lab from the normal VMware test lab that does burn-ins and things like that. So consumer SSDs, and I don't want to pick on any one vendor here, but I can think of one where, for instance, uh, if you try to sustain load on their drive for, for over 20 minutes, the latencies will shoot up 2,000 fold. There's lack of latency consistency on a lot of those drives. Uh, there's oh, one that's that part. Issue that, yeah, that, so performance consistency is a huge thing. Um, another one is endurance. A lot of them, are, they're just not rated for enough drive rights. You don't want to start losing, having disk groups go offline in rapid succession because you burn out those drives as opposed to proper SSDs. Uh, third and most concerning is power loss protection, which is a really unexciting sounding thing, but what this means is that all of these SSD drives, in order to optimize writes, they have a little volatile DRAM buffer, like a RAM cache or like a RAID controller cache almost. They're very small, but writes are initially acknowledged to that. An enterprise class drive that we support, like the ones from Micron that are on the HCL, and that's what that DC stands for, is that you have 
full protection of all data that's being written. So there's a capacitor that will protect that data and make sure that if that drive loses power, all data that was written to it stays written and stays intact. And that data integrity is a huge thing. So I've seen someone where for a lab, they built it with consumer grade drives and it was fine, but they were doing a lot of writes and they lost power. They got corrupt, silent corruption on the MFS. So you can use them for labs, you'll be fine there, but consumer SSDs with vSAN or any type of VMware solution that are acknowledging rights that aren't power loss protected is kind of a dangerous thing to do. So. Great. Um, here, I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, so do, do I need to break the bank when choosing an SSD for an all-flash vSAN? That's a good question. <clears throat> um, that's where one of the big benefits with, you know, Micron's portfolio, especially the stuff that as we release more and more different types of drives with different endurance lim limits, you can now look and say, what what is my workload going to be? You know, am I going to need really high endurance? Or if you're just looking at your average workloads, like I'm not sure and I'm just running all kinds of average, you know, desktops, regular servers, whatever, using your high endurance, the 10 fills per day SAS that we're releasing hopefully this month, and the current released M510DC, which is um, a, a write optimized drive, that will handle read optimized percent drive. of the workloads. Right, read optimized drive. Did I say write? The, <laughs> the, 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 the SAS yeah. drive is the write optimized drive. Um, but with that capabilities, I mean, like I said, that's one of the big things that we're trying to sit, show is that when you look at the cost of these drives and the endurance of, like John said, going with a data center drive, you know, these are gear, enterprise drives, so these are guaranteed for five years. Um, and you do not have to break the bank to do an all-flash VSAN. So... If you wanted to go, like I had said earlier, if you really are concerned about endurance, you have the option of going up for a higher endurance capacity tier. But what we're seeing and what VMware's tested and what we've tested, as long as you, you know, get your endurance right drive and you build your capacity correctly with the right, you know, read optimized drives, you know you do not have to break the bike to answer your question. Terrific. I think with that, uh, we're uh, pretty much out of time here. Um, you know, again, I want to thank uh, John, Jason, Jason, and Joe uh, for your time today and hope uh, we can do this again in the future. And for everyone on the uh, call, um, please remember that uh, – let me get this here. Here it comes. Uh, that uh, if you want to contact John or Jason, any of the Jasons and Joe, uh, just use the email or LinkedIn icons on the uh, speaker bio to, to connect. And plus, you can also follow all of Micron's flash storage activities using the at Micron Storage on Twitter. So again, this is uh, Matt Wilkes from uh, Micron Storage Business Unit. Uh, thanks again for attending this uh, webinar, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye bye.